Hello everyone, Vincent Thiel from HDTV Test here. I'm offsite at Westgate Hotel at CES 2019. As always, I have the pleasure of Mr. Jason Hartlove, who is the president and CEO of Nanosys here with me. And he is also the first person I've interviewed with a deeper voice than myself. So Jason, thanks again for agreeing to this interview. Of course. Well, we're here at the Westgate, but it used to be the Las Vegas uh, Hilton and of course Elvis lived at the top for many many years So I thought I had to bring my very best to deep voice uh, my very white voice for the interview today. So Fantastic. So can you give us a very quick update about the different quantum dot applications that consumers can expect in the near-term future? So a number of really exciting things have happened and so one is the QD film implementation which we first introduced in 2013 is really coming down in terms of price point where consumers are going to be able to buy entry level TVs at the 500 to 800 dollar price point and they're going to get quantum dots and all of that wide color gamut together with that technology in that really you know very accessible price point. The second thing that's really exciting is we're starting to see some new architectures emerge for really beautiful, wide viewing angle, very bright, very colorful displays, such as so-called QD OLED architectures, as well as micro LED architectures. And these are ones where we have basically a blue emissive backplane technology, whether that's an OLED or micro LED. And then the color conversion function is performed by the quantum dots, which are patterned at the subpixel level on top of those blue emitters. And we have seen at the show uh, examples of that in private booths, but nevertheless, demonstrations of both those technologies here at CES. And we think that's very, very exciting in terms of portents for what's going to be coming in 2020, 2021, in terms of new products from uh, some of the major CE makers. And then uh, in addition to that, we're also continuing to work on our emissive quantum dot technology or so-called electro-emissive quantum dots. And together with one of our major display partners, we anticipate having a monitor sized full demonstration program using cadmium free quantum dots in an emissive monitor, full color, uh, by the end of 2019. And so hopefully that will be uh, in a private demo suite in, uh, next year at CES. So some great new technologies coming as well as uh, quantum dots continuing to proliferate into the mainstream as far as accessibility to consumer price points at $500 to $800, sub $1,000. Um, we see a lot of big, broad announcements now across multiple product lines from Vizio, TCL, Hisense, and many others. So we think this is a, a very exciting year for quantum dots, hopefully somewhere between uh, five and 10 million sets uh, using quantum dots will be shipped this year, uh, which clearly you know, is, a, is a record for, uh, for the industry. The quantum dot on OLED and also quantum dot on micro LED technologies are very intriguing. What are the advantages, in your opinion, of using quantum dot on such existing display technologies? Yeah, so in both cases, you've got a couple of advantages. So one of the things that happens with three color uh, emissive systems, like a RGB emissive system, is that each of the colors because the materials that are used are typically different materials, the light emitting materials, they age differentially. And so this results in some color shift and burn in effects and other types of things that happen over time. For example, with a conventional white OLED, we see this where the yellow emissive OLED material actually ages differentially. And this results in this so-called kind of burn in being visible on OLED displays. If we have a blue emissive layer in the back plane, and then all of the color that's happening is being converted at the red subpixel by red quantum dots and the green subpixel by green quantum dots, it's the number of blue photons coming forward that impact the amount of red light or green light that come out. And so as the blue ages, which of course it's going to over time, naturally, it's going to get dimmer. That's part of you know, the set wearing out over its long lifetime as a, as a consumer product. 
the red and the green are going to get dimmer at the same rate as the blue getting dimmer. So there's going to be no color drift and the burning effect is going to be far less visible as a result of this. So this is an example of a way in which this is really going to be a huge benefit to, to OLED, which is an existing technology. In terms of micro LED, putting down a micro LED array of three colors, red micro LED pixels, green micro LED pixels, and blue micro LED pixels is incredibly difficult from a, just a mechanical and a transfer printing kind of technology perspective. Plus, each one of those three LEDs winds up with slightly different voltages and slightly different drive currents. And again, becomes a very, very big, difficult problem, engineering problem to resolve. On the other hand, if you just make a blue micro LED array, all of the pixels are exactly the same. All the drive currents are the same. All the voltages are the same. And now you're just doing your color conversion above those by patterning the quantum dots, either red or green, on top of the selected red and green subpixels. So big improvements to both technologies from manufacturing perspective, as well as lifetime, differential aging of color, uh, and many other uh, you know, benefits that these technologies are gonna be bringing. Those advantages certainly sound extremely appealing to me. Now, you mentioned that these technologies are demonstrated in private booths by certain manufacturers at the CES 2019, with maybe consumer products available in 2020 or 2021. What sort of price points are we really talking about here, realistically? Well, I think that all of our development partners, I mean, we have the, the three largest display companies in the world are investors in Nanosys. And I think that all of those companies know very well what the consumer you know, price points need to be in order for their products and technologies to really be viable. And you know, they certainly are, in my opinion, not going to be bringing out technologies that the consumer cannot reach. And so I think that these are going to be you know, very accessible technologies. Of course, ultimately, I don't have any say in that. And, you know, my material is a, is a very small part of, of course, their overall uh, cost of implementing their, their, uh, their solution. Um, but our materials are ready today, which is key for them to be able to get into mass production either in 2020 or 2021, as you said. And, you know, they're continuing to work on all of their other scale up issues related to those blue back planes. Um, so that they will have those, you know, ready with the reliability, cost performance, the yields, all of those other things that are necessary in order to really reach consumer price points. Um, and I, I think ultimately that is absolutely their goal. They want to uh, have these technologies reachable for consumers. They just want to continue to make better and better products at those consumer price points, which these technologies will enable. When I visited you over the past couple of years, on your Nanosys quantum dot application chart, there used to be a quantum dot color filter or QDCF layer. Now, what's the status of that currently? Yeah, so quantum dot color filter was a similar idea to this quantum dot color conversion layer, except that that was going to be used with an LCD modulator. One of the other key technologies that was necessary in order to make that uh, implementation work properly was to move the polarizer that's used with the LCD inside the cell. And so the so-called in-cell polarizer or wire grid polarizer was a key technology that had to also be developed in parallel with the quantum dot materials. So unfortunately, uh, the partners that we had that were working on that were unable to get the in-cell polarizer to have enough polarization power so the contrast ratio of the ensuing uh, product was not that attractive. And so, so far that remains kind of a research level project and has not proceeded to a development phase, as you said. For us, the materials that we developed really were, though I think, able to help uh, our customers envision other ways that they could use quantum dots, such as in this color conversion application. And that inevitably led to the architecture like QD OLED um, from what was originally going to be QD color filter on LCD. The majority of the quantum dot displays on the market are using your film-based solution. Are there any quantum dot on glass or Q dot displays on the market at this moment in time? 
Yeah, so we're very excited here at um, CES uh, 2019. Uh, Hewlett Packard has announced a uh, Pavilion 27 inch uh, monitor, uh, which is a beautiful monitor, very, very thin, using the Qdeon glass architecture. Um, looks great, you know, both from when you're looking at it as a display, right? So it looks great to you as the user, but it also looks great in your office environment or home environment because of that just ultra thin, very sleek form factor. And you know, the monitors out there on your desk or in your office or whatever, and you know, it, it doesn't look like your old monitor anymore with all those cables hanging off the back of it and all the rest of the stuff. So it really is a sleek, modern looking piece of artwork that you can, you know, be glad that you're looking at even when you're not using it as a display. So yeah, we're seeing the first of these Qdeon Glass product introductions um, here at CES and we expect to see many more. So from the TV side, can consumers expect a television using quantum dot on glass technology this year? Uh, so we know of companies that are working towards that, mm -hmm. um, but we don't know of their precise introduction date plans. Mm -hmm. So they might be 2019, they might be 2020. Um, again, from our perspective, the materials, and we ship those to our uh, display manufacturing partners uh, today. Uh, but ultimately what form factor they go into uh, and what product they're introducing. We only find that out just before they actually release the product. So we don't, we don't get any kind of inside information because obviously I think they don't want us pre-announcing their products. So, um, but uh, yeah, we know that we're shipping a lot of those materials out there into our display partner ecosystem. And so we fully anticipate that they're gonna be uh, bringing more products to market this year. Here in Westgate Suit this year, you have prepared several workstations with some very interesting demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through it? Sure, we've got a, a couple of different ones. Um, first, you know, we wanted to talk about wide color gamut because this is something that people hear and they think, oh, wide color gamut sounds good, right? Well, not all wide color gamut is the same. And that's a very key point. So when you make a wide color gamut with quantum dots, you get, of course, a much wider color spectrum. And you can see this in terms of things like the percent DCI P3 coverage, which the set is capable of. But people are marketing wide color gamut as, for example, 90% of DCI P3. But, you know, it still looks pretty good at 90%, although it's not over 100% as it is with a lot of quantum dot implementations. But these are typically using some new phosphor technologies like a KSF phosphor, which is a potassium silicon fluoride. And so these technologies basically on the surface sound really good. But as you look at them, and we've got a demonstration of this at one of our workstations here, those phosphors basically turn off. They turn on and they turn off very, very slowly. And so as a result, you get a lot of image artifacts and people haven't been really forthcoming uh, about talking about the fact that you see these image artifacts. So we wanted to point that out that not all wide color gamut technologies are the same. And uh, I think we've got some, some very compelling footage showing that. Um, second area here that, that we really wanna talk about is what happens with HDR10. And so HDR10 is not just having the very wide color gamut, but as you know, also up to 10,000 nits of peak brightness. So what happens when you have a 10,000 nit peak brightness signal or data set coming to your TV and your TV is only capable of something less than 10,000 nits? What the set does is it basically attempts to map that data set into its capability. And it does that through a number of tone mapping and other types of tricks to try and get that together. Well, the closer the envelope of your set is to the native HDR10 capability, the less of that kind of compression artifact that you wind up having. And so we've got a demonstration here of a Vizio uh, PQ series, uh, which is a 2400 nits peak brightness, showing some full HDR10 content that goes up to 10,000 nits and how it resolves that data you know, for visual display. And we also have the latest LG OLED set and so how this set, which only goes to 700 nits of peak brightness, but it's far less color volume, 
how that set resolves the same kind of uh, content. And what you can see is that through that compression process, you actually lose a tremendous amount of information. And so this comes across as both a much more clipped looking image, but also in fact, a loss of a lot of resolution because a lot of the resolution is in those finer details. And once that data starts to get compressed down, all the pixels wind up looking exactly the same on the set, although they're not in the data, in the data set. So uh, I think these are, are two very compelling uh, examples that we have of why you really want to have high peak brightness um, and why, you know, HDR10 is very important and also why, you know, color gamut's important and the technologies behind color gamut are also critically important. Yes, Jason, I fully understand what you are talking about. And just a point of reminder to any viewers out there who are watching on YouTube with all the compression that's going on, I have actually inserted some bureau footages of these demonstrations that Jason has talked about earlier in the interview. But because of the limited dynamic range of my camera and also with YouTube's compression, the differences may not be fully visible to you but you know in real life as i'm standing here i can see exactly what jason is talking about in terms of the pfs phosphor introducing sort of a red smearing effect when there's a moving object going across the screen and i think this was most prominent actually on the panasonic dx900 or dx902 led lcd from 2016. i actually pointed that out in my review with this slow red phosphor decay that is actually causing a red smearing effect. And with regards to the HDR10, I would love to get my hands on the AJA color front system that does this sort of fantastic analysis. But in real life, what I can see is that the PQ quantum is resolving the sun fully. And on the OLED, the sun, even though it is there, it is so compressed that it might as well be clipped. And if you don't actually see it from the YouTube footage, it's because my camera just doesn't have the dynamic range. I need to get myself a red camera, to be <laughs> honest. Yeah. So my camera just doesn't have enough dynamic range to fully encapsulate and display all the finer points that we are talking about. But I can certainly see it standing here, and I hope that you can believe me. So. Thank you very much for your time, Jason. Really yeah. appreciate you speaking to us. Your in-depth technical knowledge is always very useful to our viewers. And I think they will really appreciate the updates that you give with regards to different quantum dot applications coming on the market. Great. Thank you very much for having me. And guys, please uh, subscribe and, and uh, promote and uh, support so that he can get himself a, a nice red camera uh, so that he can bring you even uh, better looking quality content uh, in the future. So thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Have a great CES. Thank you very much. You too.